I'm curious to see how how loud that is, actually. Mm, and I want to make sure that this is good for you and your voice and your quietude. <coughs> that cough was really good. So this is Jeffrey doing, <laughs> doing, doing ASMR. <laughs> Expositive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila, and I'm horizontal in a man cave Airbnb in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Miller, and I'm horizontal with Lila. And we've got some interesting soundage happening. There was a there was a grr, grr happening from kind of inside the closet. There's some footfalls. There's the train right outside, and fish tank. Oh yes, with jellyfish. Fake jellyfish, real little fish, and so that's and some traffic. And the M train. So that's what we're working with. <laughs> Local color. We will adapt, improvise, and overcome. Ooh. Adapt, improvise, and overcome. Is that an evolutionary psych phrase? That's a U.S. Marine Corps phrase. Really? Yeah. Welcome to the podcast of intimacies recorded while lying down. Horizontal is slow radio, consensual eavesdropping, private conversations made public. In this episode, I lie down with Jeffrey Miller, Ph.D., evolutionary psychology professor, author of books, out polyamorist, and lifelong investigator of human nature. I met Jeffrey at a dinner party hosted by a blue man and curated by an adventuresome scholar of the brain, expressly for the purpose of discussing the future of intimacy. The sex scientist Dr. Jana was there, our mutual friend, and my horizontal guest of episodes four and five. She and the Brain Scholar invited Jeffrey. In fact, the dinner party was scheduled around his visit to New York. And then I knew why. He would listen and listen. And then say something so incisive, so crystalline clear, backed by conscientious research and immersion in the topic of human sexuality. He spoke quietly, and with a gravitas reserved for someone who has studied their studies and lectured their lectures and doesn't need to prove any of it to you. He was also a bit rakish in the way that my first ever lover was. They have the same je ne sais quoi about the eyes, a mischievousness, an insouciant uplooking through a fringe of lashes, a domliness that's only partly concealed by their glasses, but quite loudly visible if you know how to look for that sort of thing. We recorded on a king bed in a man cave in Bushwick, Brooklyn, an Airbnb that Jeffrey had rented for his New York stay. There was a fish tank, an enormous leather couch, and a flat screen TV that took up an entire wall. Because we recorded in my neighborhood, this episode has plenty of local color. If it's not the overhead train squealing to a stop, it's the incessant galumphing of the toddler upstairs, or the ice cream truck playing its deathly tune in the background. If you add in some planes, cringeworthy music played at an unholy decibel, and a whole lot of sirens, this is what it's like to live in Brooklyn. Or at least, in my part of Brooklyn. In this, the first part of our voluminous, far-ranging conversation, we talked about his family dynasty, 11 aunts and uncles, 28 cousins, growing up with intellectual activist parents, his dad's weekly pre-college briefings about things that will happen in New York, lecture one, prostitutes, an act of sexual altruism, a tale of CPR dummies and lady ghosts of the asylum, the difference between anthropology and evolutionary psychology. 80s cotillions. Dating before cell phones. The similarities between Jeffrey and his brother the preacher. 
Heteroflexibility, Bisexual Stigma, Talking to College Students About Polyamory, How Jeffrey Met His First Wife and Became Instant Stepdad, Struggling with Monogamy, Stepfathering in Prehistory, How Marital Therapy Fails Men, Psychotherapy Solutions versus Manosphere Solutions, Why Most Clinical Psychologists Aren't Well-Versed in Different Relationship Styles, and Jeffrey's Coming Out Polly Story. And then I begin the tale of how I met Patrick, which starts at 14 rooms and culminates at the Love Immersive, with Steve Dean as the catalyst. In the second part of my conversation with Jeffrey, which will be released next week as episode 88, I dive deep into the massive revelation I had around my own jealousy, and he gives me a broader understanding of my emotions from an evolutionary psych perspective. To listen to that episode, become a patron of the Horizontal Arts at $7 or more per month. Yes, yes, there's now a $7 tier by popular request. Patreon is the love child of crowdfunding and a subscription service. And $7 a month gives you access to The Full Horizontal, which means all the Part 2 episodes and any bonus episodes, which, P.S., one such bonus episode shall be released very soon. Plus an invite to the secret patrons group and all our patron get-togethers. Go to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. And now, come lie down with us in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Adapt, improvise, and overcome. That's powerful. So, Jeffrey. You've had burning questions all day. They weren't questions. It was a story I want to tell you. Tell me. But... I am torn between that and also wanting to start with, you know, your, the beginning, the origin. Starting at the of origin Jeffrey is always good. Your origin story, the making. Fourteen billion years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. No, this is the thing about being an evolutionary psychologist is people ask for your, <laughs> like, what's your story? Where are you from? And your first thought often goes to, like, place to see in Africa because you, you actually think that's where my human nature is from, you know? So you've got this kind of deep time perspective. You know, I could talk about where I was born and raised, but to me that's just a little, a little blip on a kind of deep multi-generational story. A blip in the making of me a jeffrey story yeah so we're starting 14 billion years ago yeah there were there were particles no i was born and raised <laughs> <laughs> i was born and raised in cincinnati ohio in the midwest in america on earth in in the line of case super cluster and <laughs> what yeah no i would love to actually have you trace the things you feel that most make up you from an evolutionary perspective, because that would be fascinating. I think my family background is a little bit unusual because my um, maternal grandfather was really, really interested in genetics and families and dynasties. And he had 12 kids. Whoa. On purpose. And he was also very careful to select a woman, a mate, who he, he thought would be stable, smart, capable, you know, be a good mom to a lot of kids, but also a good role model. And he managed to find such a woman. This is, you said your mom's... My, my mom's mom. Your mom's mother. Yeah. So your mom's father is named... Henry, Henry Baker. And... And he, his partner... Virginia. Virginia. So Henry and Virginia, 12 kids. So I have 11 aunts and uncles. I've got about 28 cousins and grew up with a lot of contact with a lot of them, I'd go over and visit them. You know, they lived about a mile away. And I had aunts, uncles, so many. And it kind of brought home to me, I guess from an early age, the idea that family's important, that people vary quite a bit <laughs> in how many kids they have, and that that could have kind of downstream effects, you know, evolutionary effects. So that might have set the stage a little bit for 
me becoming an evolutionary psychologist. Well, you had so later. many people to observe. That's interesting. And you could, al- you could almost see this sort of Mendelian, you know, randomization of like who gets which little personality traits amongst those siblings. You could see sort of every possible combination play out. That there was a sort of genetic roulette in terms of mm-hmm. personality exactly. traits. Exactly, yeah. And they showed up in some siblings and not in others. Yeah, and yeah exactly. What did you learn from watching your parents' relationship about relationshiping? I think my parents had a very interesting relationship because they're both really smart, competent, emotionally stable people, mostly. They're both really civically engaged. They cared a lot about local politics. They were kind of activists about the causes they cared about. We would talk about that at the dinner table. So they... So when my parents were strategizing about these local political issues, they would treat each other as like dead, equal collaborators, you know, schemers, strategists. Comrades. Comrades. But the sort of power dynamic was my dad was very much the sort of decision maker and my mom sort of went along with stuff. Although he had this joke he used to like to tell, which was, well, look, the man's job is to make the really important decisions like you know, what we should do about Red China and should we increase American defense spending and, you know, how do we produce civil rights? And the women make the trivial decisions like how many kids do we have, where do we live, where do the kids go to school, what do we spend the family budget on, etc. So he kind of understood that she had quite a bit of the sort of practical and financial power. Hmm. I think what I saw was a meeting of two people who really respected each other's intelligence and trusted each other's intelligence. Did you always know you were smart? Yeah. Do you have an early memory of learning that? Went off to summer camp at age 11. They sort of tried to force you to play baseball after lunch hour when it was very hot in West Virginia. And I didn't like baseball. So I just hid out in the tent and I designed submarines because <laughs> I had brought my drafting equipment and my like mechanical pencils and, you know, the little ellipses and circles and shit that you draw with. And the camp counselors would stop in and go, Miller, what are you doing? You're supposed to be playing shortstop. And I'd be like, I'm designing a submersible aircraft carrier. This is important. <laughs> this could help America. And they'd be like, okay, fine. <laughs> Do what you sorry, want, kid. Like, yeah, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> this is important for America. Oh, my God, I love the the integrity. and. I was such a little patriot. Wow. Wow. When did you start to question authority? I always questioned authority if I had a teacher who was saying things that I knew were either factually wrong or were kind of ideologically biased or where I knew that they were withholding crucial information from us. So for example, 10th grade, we're reading Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare analysis, and it's all about young love. And in 10th grade, everybody has young love and everybody's either resonating painfully to the story or they haven't bothered to read it yet. And my teacher says, so Jeffrey, young man of the world. What's your view on this? Because apparently I had a reputation as a guy who dates more than other 10th graders date. Oh. And I felt very put on the spot, but I tried to make something up, you know, that sounded worldly and advicey. You remember what you said? Man of the world. I could make something up, but... But you don't remember. I was looking across at Abby Cohen, on whom I had a massive crush, and she was turning pink with, like, secondhand embarrassment, and that kind of threw me off. Oh. Oh, Abby Cohen. Did you have early crushes, early sexual urges that you recall, and were you, what did you learn about sex growing up? My mom was quite into the women's movement. She campaigned for equal rights. She was in the League of Women Voters. She campaigned for pro-choice stuff. 
but we didn't really have a lot of explicit sex education. I did start falling in love with various girls, kind of fifth and sixth grade onwards. And I think I was always a little bit poly, polyamorous in the sense that I found it totally reasonable to sort of have a crush on more than one girl at a time. Right. So you had, you had multiple objects of affection. Yeah. And there were objects of affection. Like I, I wouldn't have had any idea what to do with any of them sexually at all. I didn't know how sex worked. I didn't really lust after them. I just found them amazing and fascinating creatures. And when you say you weren't taught a lot explicitly, do you really mean that you weren't taught anything explicitly? I would say pretty much, yeah. I mean, before I went off to college, my dad sat me down for a series of highly structured weekly briefings on things that will happen in New York, right? And he had also gone to Columbia, where I was about to go. Oh. And he obviously went a couple decades earlier, but lecture one was sort of about prostitutes, and you might meet these women who earn a living a certain way, and here's how to deal with them. Lecture one was about prostitutes when there had been no sex talk? Mm. He's just assuming yeah. at this point that you figured out what sex is. He, he knew I was not a virgin at that point. Yeah. And then, like, lecture two was homosexuals, and there, there are homosexuals in New York, and here's the issues with that. And What did he say about that? Basically, just like you're a good-looking young man, and they will take an interest, and you can either, you know, respond to that or not, but just be aware and try to be safe. This was literally about one year before the AIDS crisis blew up. Whoa. Right. When he said, try to be safe, did he teach you about condoms? Did he... No, not really. And what did he tell you how to deal with prostitutes or sex workers? It was, I mean, to his credit, I think he was trying to be as non-judgmental as possible. And like, lots of guys go visit them. Lots of guys don't. If you go visit them, treat them with respect. They're trying to make a living. That's you know? great. And of course, the awkward thing is when you're the son, you're like thinking in the back of your mind, well, Dad, Dad. Have, have you, how much experience do you have of these issues? Right. You know, which he did not share. He did not share no. personal stories. He just no. was sharing guidance or. Yeah, just guidance. So lecture one, sex workers. Lecture two, homosexuals. Lecture three. Lecture three might have been nurses. Nurses? I think he dated a lot of nurses. <laughs> and he liked nurses. And he thought they were smart and practical. And it was sort of like, because when he went to Columbia, it was all male. So they had a date outside campus. Oh. Like go to the nursing school or teaching school or whatever. But the year I went to Columbia, it literally turned co-ed. It went from 0% female to 45% female in one year. So was this an endorsement of nurses as yes. dates? Yes. Fascinating. I love that he did this once a week. This is amazing. Was there a lecture for? I can't remember. It might have been about, maybe about STIs or pregnancy or don't settle down too soon or... At some point you got a, you got a condom talk? I don't think I ever got an explicit condom talk either in high school or from the parents. You knew they existed? I knew they existed. I used them. You know, I lost my virginity age 17 and you got, had your sexual debut my sexual debut <laughs> it was sort of taken from me by a wonderful woman i'm still in touch with who was very assertive and knew what she was doing and that sounds great it was it was about as good and untraumatic as these things could be i think there's a part of me that really wishes that every young man had that had an initiatory rite of passage and was taught by an experienced woman how to engage sexually and was kind of like welcomed into their manhood in that way instead of trying to imitate porn and it was very welcoming and I'm, I'm all, I've always been grateful for that because it's very easy for young women to kind of make fun of guys if they don't know what they're doing if they're awkward yeah whatever but her view was 
oh, it's his first time, so of course he won't know what he's doing. Four play skills will be largely absent. Endurance won't be there, et cetera, et cetera. But her view was if you kind of hold space for all of that and have a bit of a sense of humor about it, mm-hmm. then you can make it a good and memorable sex positive foundation. Yeah. So it was, I th- it was a real act of sexual altruism, I mm. think. That's beautiful. Had you had any other sexual experiences earlier where you were, you were playing, there were hands, maybe you had oral sex before? A little bit of that. Well, there was one, one funny story involving CPR dummies. <laughs> oh, tell me. So I just started in Boy Scouts. This is probably about age 14. And for some reason, they decided to have the week-long, not week, the, the weekend-long training camp about doing CPR and first aid. They had it in an abandoned insane asylum. What? In Cincinnati, Ohio. So about a dozen of us Boy Scouts show up and they bring about six of these CPR dummies, you know, no legs, no arms. And we practice all day giving CPR to these dummies in this asylum. Then gradually the other kids get like picked up by their parents. Fewer and fewer of us are left and there's sort of both male and female CPR dummies. And of course, being young men, we kind of gravitate to working on the female dummies. Because they have breasts. They have breasts. And... That, you know, that's the challenge is but, how do you do it with the... With oh, around the, and right. And not, okay. Yeah, and not, not grab the breasts or not. I remember somebody in a CPR mm-hmm. course saying you had to be careful because if somebody had at this time silicone implants, mm-hmm. you could... Rupture. You could bust them. So then we started telling horror stories about what must have gone on in the insane asylum. Oh, and, dear. And the rumor spread it was all for, only for women. And so there was kind of a perfect storm of like horny 14-year-old boy scouts and CPR dummies with fake boobs and (laughs) fantasies of like insane women who may or may not have left ghosts behind in the bowels of this abandoned building. Right. And I think it kind of fucked me up a little bit, but (laughs) (laughs) I certainly came home a little rattled. After that. But what I, happened? I had many. After that. Well. After what? The only thing that really happened was I was the last one to get picked up. So at a certain point, it was just me and the six dummies and waiting for my mom to come and everyone else had left. And No, no it, supervision? No, no. The, the, the scout leader had gone off as well. And left a little boy in a former insane asylum by himself to get picked up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is before the coddling of the American mind you know, uh, thing. And uh, this okay. is, so anyway, I think it kind of opened up my um, erotic imagination a little bit. I was about to say, most of it was, was your imagination. Were you talking about it? I was just realizing that there, you could have interesting, semi-erotic, kind of fucked up experiences that are very hard to put a, a sort of a crisp label on. Like, was that a bad experience? Was it a good experience? Hard mm. to say. Was it interesting? Absolutely. Was it scary? Yes. Memorable? Yes. Did it make me think a lot more about, well, what would sex be like with women who are clinically insane? Yeah, I mm. thought about that more. Did it intertwine some fear with your eroticism at all? Yeah, for sure. Because some of the guys have been talking about, well, what if the crazy female ghosts, you know, kidnap us and put us in the basement and do things to us and what will they do to us and <laughs> so there was a lot of latent kind of kink content to the, the the chatter right and the fantasy of them being insane and not knowing what they were doing gave permission to the boys to be aroused i think yeah Like, I don't know, I was just overcame by this crazy ghost, this crazy lady ghost. Yeah, you also got a similar thing in in the summer camp in West Virginia, which... um,
So the summer camp in West Virginia literally was just down the road, about six miles from an asylum for criminally insane women there. And while we were dancing away at our disco music, you know, listening to the Bee Gees, we would talk about, well, what if they all like had a mass jailbreak and got out and like came to the camp and kidnapped us and, <laughs> and like took us down the river in canoes and, and what would happen? When you say criminally insane, what do you mean? As in they'd been... They had committed felonies and been remanded to custody in the hospital rather than regular jail because they were not guilty by reason of insanity. Got it. So that, that sparked our imaginations quite a bit. I've been really living with this idea. The first book that sent me down the rabbit hole of sex positivity that my friend gave me to read, he gave me a series of three. It was Arousal, The Secret Logic of Sexual Fantasies, Michael Bader, and then and then Mating, no, then Sex at Dawn, and then Mating in Captivity. Mm. And the basic premise of Arousal as our fantasies making it safe for us to feel sexually aroused was and still is an incredible lens for me and was mind-blowing at the time that I read it. In this story that I'm going to tell you, I had a huge revelation related to it as well. So now I hear fantasies and I think about how it makes the fantasizer feel safe to be aroused and what, what fears it might assuage so that the person can feel aroused. Well, it is striking with all of these fantasies about being kidnapped by the insane ladies. It's almost an exact parallel, right, to women's fantasies of being kidnapped by pirate captains. Or, right. Or Genghis Khan or whatever, where suddenly you're not responsible for whatever happens sexually because right, it's, it's out of your control. You've been spirited away. And, you know, whatever the, uh, the husband stabbing psychopath ladies do to you is not your fault. Not your fault. Growing up in the Midwest, receiving no sex talks and basically no sex education of any kind, it sounds like. Most of the people that I've spoken to who have that history grew up with a vague sense of shame, but it was, they can't remember and they can't pinpoint a time when they were told this is bad or don't masturbate, but they just curried this sense of shame and then carried it and then have most of them have done a lot of work in order to undo it. Did you not have that experience? I had one little thing like that in 10th grade health class where we had a pretty well-intentioned teacher, but he was fairly old school and religious. And we had a little class about masturbation, which was extremely vague and euphemistic. And then we had a little quiz about masturbation. And I remember one item in particular, and this is like now almost 40 years later, so I guess it left the mark. Mm -hmm. What's the most important thing to know about masturbation? And like, A, it can cause blindness. B, mentally ill people do it more. C, it has no bad side effects. Or D, it is habit forming. And I chose C, it has no bad side effects. Mm -hmm. The allegedly correct answer was it's habit forming. And when the teacher marked this and I got the paper back, I knew that he knew, right, that I thought it was cool, no mm -hmm. problem, no bad side effects. But he kind of, for the sake of the curriculum guide, had to say it's, it's habit forming and implicitly bad. Hmm. So I remember being kind of embarrassed about that for a good day or two afterwards. And like couldn't quite meet his eyes and felt fidgety in class, which of course is an insane overreaction because he gets dozens of guys saying every possible answer on these quizzes. But for me, just A, not getting a perfect score on a test mm. hurt because I was very invested in that identity as a straight-A student. Mm -hmm. And B... <laughs> Me making too. an error that makes me seem like a pervert in my eyes, and possibly is, was kind of shameful. But the shame was like all self-generated. It wasn't really like him calling me up in front of class and saying, oh, Miller, you got this wrong. Right. It was just my overactive imagination imagining that he was would, judging, would be you. judging you. 
And it wasn't coming from church. You didn't have that no, I grew indoctrination. Up, I grew up an atheist. And both your parents were atheists. Yeah, my dad was an atheist ever since college, and my mom was like raised Lutheran, but not really a believer. Do you know where this masturbation causes blindness thing came in? Who made that up? Historically, oh man, I don't know. It's it's pretty weird. Um, it's it's a very strange thing. Why why that thing? <laughs> Why'd they pick that thing? It, it's scary, I guess. Often, you know, when you're masturbating, if you're male, you're using visual materials as stimuli, and so the mm. idea that it like the badness comes in through the eyes, and then you wouldn't be able to see anymore, so you wouldn't right. be able to get that. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. It sounds like like a little um, pony upstairs, you know? <laughs> there are toddlers upstairs. Oh, okay. I think. <laughs> that makes sense. Little galumphing feet. Galumph, 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 galumph. <laughs> Reminds me of the, the when I lived with a cat in a, in a railroad apartment, and the cat would go all the way across from the front to the back. Galloping cats. I'm very feline. In temperament. I don't want to be touched when I don't want to be touched. Very, very particular about the laps I sit on. Want my space, want to survey the whole thing, the whole party, the whole event, the whole space before I pick my space to sit down. Mm -hmm. Or maybe leave. Maybe I won't even stay because I, I've surveyed and, and it has been deemed lacking and then I will leave. <laughs> if you leave me alone, I'll be much more likely to come over to you <laughs> than if you chase me around like a dog. I've never quite figured out what my spirit animal is. I think, and actually, for evolutionary psychology people, in a way, we kind of feel like aliens on this planet, and our spirit animal kind of is being human. Really? Because it doesn't come naturally to us. Why... Why? Why do you think that your colleagues feel like aliens? Why do you feel well, like an alien? because you have to be a little bit able to step back from ordinary life to kind of analyze how does human nature work? Why do emotions operate like this? Why do we have the preferences we have? Why, why, why? Where does it come from? Most people are content to kind of go through life saying, um, well, of, of course we are attracted to the other sex and obviously jealousy is powerful and natural and moral and of course we seek status and blah 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 and all the f psych people i know from college onwards thought this is a very puzzling species i'm in and i don't get it and i want to understand it better but doesn't it it seems to me that these are the people who never lost the insatiable curiosity of the three-year-old that asks why. Why that? Why? But why that? Why? Why? Why, though? You know, it keeps, keeps asking the whys about after giving the answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of that. You know, scientists in general retain that curiosity, but it gets directed into different subjects and domains and, and obsessions and... You know, it might be directed into where did the universe come from, or it might be directed into what the hell is going on in women's brains. Mm -hmm. And I took the, the second route, pretty much. What is your, your elevator explanation, your elevator pitch explanation for evolutionary psychology, if somebody's never heard of it? I'd say it's a branch of psychology that studies human nature that studies the thoughts and feelings and responses and preferences that all humans have in common across cultures and throughout history. And we try to understand all of those things by thinking really hard about the challenges that our ancestors faced hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, how they survived, found food, found mates, reproduced, raised kids, lived in tribal societies, how they coped with all of that. So we're trying to understand who we are now based on 
sort of who they were then and what tasks they had to um, master so that we could be here. What distinguishes anthropology from evolutionary psychology? They're pretty closely aligned, and we draw a lot from anthropology. So about half of the PhD students I've mentored have actually been in anthropology. Psych tends to focus more on what's happening inside the head and uses methods that are more like brain imaging or surveys or interviews or whatever. Anthropologists tend to focus more on sort of overt behavior that you can witness and photograph and videotape and analyze. And also anthropologists tend to focus more on other cultures. And we tend to focus more on sort of modern societies, like with screechy M-line railway wheels. Mm, my new partner, Patrick, gets so frustrated when he hears it, but not for the same reason that I do. I get frustrated because it's a horrible noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he gets frustrated because he's an engineer mm -hmm. and he knows that we can do better and that many, many people made the decision not to. Yeah. Because this was a poor neighborhood. Yeah. Or whatever. People made the decision to cut the corners, mm -hmm. decrease people's quality of life because of it. A place like China where they're building up, you know, the high-speed rail and massive urban subway systems incredibly quickly. They seem pretty determined to make high-quality transport available to everybody. Although even there, you know, they might do it a little better in the richer areas. After your sexual debut... Oh, wait. So you said you did more than the average 14-year-old dating. Yeah. So not having more sex, but actually going out, going to parties, going to cotillion dances. I really want you to set the scene for these cotillions. Okay. So I don't know if this is something that still happens with Gen Z or millennials, but back in the day, back in the early 80s, there's a thing called cotillion. Most big cities had it. And it was for the sort of upper middle class bourgeois kids who would get invited if they were from the right families. And you'd have dances four times a year. The young men would wear full evening coats, tuxedos. The young women would wear ball gowns, cocktail dresses. And you'd get together and have canapes and snacks and non-alcoholic beverages. And they would rent big rooms and country clubs and you would try to learn how to flirt and talk and dance and interact and do you know young adult stuff so it's kind of like debutante balls the same kind of vibe maybe. but you said to 70s punk music yeah but of course <laughs> the, the concession they made to, to the youth <laughs> to the youth of the day was they knew we were all into punk and new wave music so that's what they played so you have this, this specter of, you know, 200 young men in tuxedos doing the pogo to um, God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols. The pogo? Yeah. Just jumping up and down vertically and play oh. as high as you can. <laughs> it's not like a sex position. I've, I've actually never heard anybody refer to it that way. I love it. It sounds all completely ridiculous and absurd, but it did push even introverted kids like me into kind of learning how to take a chance, walking across the room and, you know, asking a girl to dance and knowing it's kind of 50-50 whether she'll say yes or no. And it was segregated by uh, yeah. gender, side to side. And then once I actually got my, you know, car license and you got some mobility, then everybody just started dating all over the time, all over the place. And these are proper dates back, in, back before mobile phones. This is getting a girl's home phone number and there would be one number for the home calling up and saying rotary phone rotary phone <laughs> calling up <laughs> oh hello mrs krakowski um may i please speak to to your daughter jennifer this is so and so call you know from from high school and then they'd have to get the daughter on the phone hey it's for you it's that oh it's not the boy you want okay it's some other boy okay here and then oh. You have to, oh, no. like, say, hi, um, you might remember me from, you know, math team and, 
you want to like go out and see a movie? And then you physically write down the address and like use a paper map to try to find your way to where she lived and pick her up. Go and, pick her up. And then like take her to the movie and the ice cream and all of that. That's how it worked. In my 20s, I joked with my best friend at the time that dating in New York City in your 20s was like being in high school anywhere else because you were like, he lives alone? He has a car? Oh my God. <laughs> this is amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> because it's so, it's still so rare. You know, I still feel that way. He lives alone. He has a car. Excellent. <laughs> I loved it because I, I was always very sapiosexual. I was always attracted to intelligent women. I loved having, you know, long, meaningful conversations about this or that. I think because I was at a high school that was quite selective and there was tracking and smart kids tended to end up knowing each other, it was very easy to find interesting people to date, maybe even more so than in, you know, a big city like this. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's because it was a, a kind of scene that was selected, that was curated in a way? It was definitely curated because the, this sort of smart middle class parents of Cincinnati, Ohio, fought really, really hard to keep at least one public high school selective with tracking entrance exams, with AP classes and honors mm. programs and all that. So partly so their kids could meet other similar kids. And the same high school is still going. It's still doing that. It's still kind of famous for that. And I know most kids did not have a good time in high school, weren't able to find a good peer group. But I really lucked out, and I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Are you still friends with some of them? Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. It's a, a really rare story, mm -hmm. I think. Did you have siblings? Yeah, I have a younger brother. What was the relationship like with him? What was the the landscape of the, the household. He was a little more extroverted and, and physical, and I just like to read science fiction books, and so we didn't have a whole lot in common, but got along fine. Later, we kind of went somewhat separate ways because he became a born-again Christian in his around age 20, went to Bible college, married a woman he found in Bible college. They had a couple kids. He became a Pentecostal preacher wow. for quite a while. And so our views were quite different, but we did have certain things in common, like we both loved public speaking. Hmm. And kind of in our own ways valued family life. You know, as a preacher, he has to do pastoral counseling, and that means people come to him with relationship problems. Hmm. Just the way kids come to my office hours with relationship problems. They do. Yeah. Because of the fact that you teach human sexuality? Exactly. So if you teach in human sexuality and you have a class on sexual coercion and rape, then you'll sometimes get students come in and talk about stuff that's happened. Yeah. Or you talk about sexual orientation and you get kids coming in and they're not, not quite sure anymore what their orientation is. And how do they sort that out? I love how many more options there are that we have language for, for people nowadays with their orientation yeah. and their gender presentation and their, their gender, not just their presentation. When I cover orientation, I try to include a lot of those new terms like heteroflexible because... Such a good one. I think a lot of... A lot of guys in particular get very confused if they've had some sexual experiences with other other boys or men right. at different points. And There's then, the joke, you suck one dick. Right. And yet they might have 90% of their fantasy life and the, and the porn viewing, you know, dominated by women. Ten years ago, they would have been very confused because this course would have taught, well, you're, you're straight or you're gay or there's a few guys who are bi, but that's weird and stigmatized the course would have taught that yeah well i mean objectively there is a lot of stigma against males who are bi definitely still i i took sex and gender in college i don't remember bisexuality being 
prominently mentioned. And I took it at NYU. Mm-hmm. It would have been 2002. Yeah, that's sad because, you know, there's a lot of women who are bi or at least sexually fluid and sort of whoever they're attracted to of either sex they're attracted to. and Female sexual fluidity. Yeah. Also sometimes called pansexuality or pansexual mm-hmm. identity, right? Yeah. But clearly to me, there would be a lot more men who are bisexual if it wasn't so terrifically stigmatized. And they're getting it from all angles. They're getting it from... Women that they might want to date who feel uncomfortable dating a bisexual man. I've never myself, I don't think, dated a bisexual man. Maybe some, maybe a heteroflexible with who's had a few encounters, but not someone who identified as bisexual. I don't think. And I'll have to examine that in myself to see if that's if I'm indoctrinated with some of that stigma as well. And then they're also getting it from gay men, like Mm -hmm. you know, well. I remember we used to we used to joke, oh, he's GBG, gay by graduation. <laughs> and, yeah. And maybe some of those men were bi. And that joke was part of stigmatizing them. And I feel ashamed for my part in that. Hmm. I do not want to contribute to that at all. I really, obviously, in the way that I live my life, I want to promote choice and freedom of sexual expression and full expression and also allowing people to change and change their relationship style as Mm -hmm. they change and their environment changes and who they love changes. It seems to me that the single most detrimental opinion or constriction about human sexual and romantic relationships is that they should remain the way that they started and that you should choose a way and go with it and that if you deviate from it, then you failed. And this goes also for the other way around, not just monogamy into polyamory, Mm -hmm. but people who have experimented with polyamory and say, you know, actually, that's not for me now, getting shit from their poly community, which is crazy to me as a subculture I would think you would be more respectful of people's choices and people's ability to to shift. Hopefully our lives are long. We have many lives to live within this one life. Yeah, so I'm I'm a big science fiction fan. And one of my favorite authors is Ian M. Banks. And Banks wrote a series of books called The Culture Books that are about far future societies, which are very, very sex positive. Hmm. The Culture Books? Yeah. There's half a dozen of them or so. And in them, people live arbitrarily long, however long they want, because they have advanced biomedical procedures. People can switch sexes very easily. Mm. Their bodies can just kind of rewire themselves. They can kind of play around with their sexual orientation. They tend to be kind of pansexual. And it's kind of expected in that society that if you're going to live for 600 to 800 years... Of course, your sexuality is going to develop over the course of that many centuries, and you will have explored kind of every possible thing you can explore sooner or later. And you're not going to have some fixed identity that you just lock into at age 18 Mm -hmm. and stick with, because that makes no sense if you live that long. Right. And I found that quite an inspiring way to to think about it. Even if you live into my age, which is, you know, early 50s, you realize, wow, I've gone through a lot of different phases in my erotic, romantic, sexual life that I never could have anticipated back at age 20. Can you trace them for me? Can you give me a a timeline? Mm -hmm. I think the basic timeline for me was I loved dating different women kind of in parallel throughout high school and college. In parallel? What do you mean? Like, I would have one person I'd see maybe once or twice a month, another person I'd have a little fling with that would be like see her twice a week, but it would only last a couple of months. So it was quite complicated. In a way, it was polyamory, but in a way, it was totally unethical poly. Well, it was non-monogamy. Nobody, right. Nobody knew exactly what else was going on. 
I didn't know who the other women were dating. They didn't know who I was dating. But that's kind of how... That's kind of how it's happening now, how, right? How it worked. Right. That's how it worked in college. College. In, in the 80s. Well, I would venture to say it's probably still happening now. Yeah. Mo- on most campuses. And yeah, when I talk to my students about polyamory, I say, look, it's basically the casual dating that you guys are already doing, but with more mutual knowledge about what is actually happening so that everybody can kind of buy into it. Right, and make informed choices. Yeah. So you were doing some of this parallel dating. A lot of that. In, um, the first mark on, on our timeline is is high school and college, high parallel school and dating. College, also grad school. Or unethical non-monogamy. Yeah, or at least non-transparent. <laughs> but then I did have a few monogamist relationships that were more exclusive. Like one that lasted a year and a half in college, some that lasted six months, ten months in grad school. And while you were in them, did you did you feel that that was the right thing for you? Did you have an idea that that would be the right thing for you for a long time? Or were, did you say to yourself, hmm, I could be with this person for right now? Some of them I thought, oh, I could actually stay with this person indefinitely or forever. Some of them were pretty serious. Others I thought, I'm having so much fun learning about whatever this person is into. Mm. Like, oh, you're doing a PhD in sociolinguistics and doing ride arounds with cops and learning about how cops talk about their patrol. Cool. I want to learn about that, you know. And the way that you felt you could learn about it was through a sexual relationship. Yeah. Sometimes I I get annoyed at at some of the poly people that I know because I'm like you could just be friends with that person Mm -hmm. and and learn about what they're (laughs) what they're doing and and take part in the activities that they take part in does that really need to be and it's because of the the primacy Mm -hmm. that we've placed in our society on the sexual and romantic relationships that that's the case that so many people feel like they actually have to have to have that component in order to be able to have the kind of intimate relationship that would allow them to, let's say, learn about somebody's PhD and cuddle. (laughs) I know in principle, sure, you should be able to have a friend who you can cuddle with and develop a burning fascination with their dissertation topic, (laughs) right, in principle. (laughs) It would be great. In fact, though, what tends to happen is, I think guys in particular tend to take more of a, a like a genuine interest in what women are into if they're dating and having sex. And I think that's okay because guys who have a bunch of experiences like that learn to see women as complete beings with their own careers and ambitions and intellectual interests. And become more well-rounded men as a result. Yeah, I think so. So there's the parallel dating phase or the less than transparent Mm non-monogamy. And then you had a monogamous life up until six years ago. It's non-monogamy, but in succession. It's, it's, you know, monogamous. That's what uh, Astaire always says, right? It used to be monogamy meant one person for life. Now it means one person at a time. (laughs) (laughs) So I had some serial, serial monogamy in grad school. Yeah. And then I went to England for a postdoc after I did the dissertation. Didn't really date there. The British confused me. But then <laughs> you I, mean with their... Well, mostly the rep- problem was the drinking culture. I don't drink. And going to the pub was basically the only way to meet people. Mm. I would have a hard time there too then. Yeah. So eventually a science journalist came to interview me and we started dating. We fell in love. That was my my first wife. So we were together 16 years. Wow. Did you ever drink? Was it something that you stopped doing? I never really liked it. Can you set the scene of this story of meeting your first wife? I was giving a talk at London School of Economics that was invited by a friend of mine who was running a series of amazing talks called the Darwin Seminars. 
that really put evolutionary psychology on the map in Britain in the in the 90s. Mm. So I was giving a talk about my dissertation ideas about how human mate choice shaped the evolution of the human mind. My future wife was in the audience. She was a TV science producer and was looking for stories, always to do documentaries about for BBC or whatever. And she thought the ideas were cool. And so she said, I should come down and interview you down in Sussex where you're working. She came down and we had a nice couple hours chatting about things and then met at one of the uh, F-Site conferences, had dinner, dated. And, you know, it was a lot to take on board because she had two teenage kids already. Wow. And I was just 29 at the time. And then you were an instant stepdad. So I, then when we moved in together, I was instant stepdad to a teenage son and teenage girl who was going off to college. How did it work to become integrated into their family? It was surprisingly easy in some ways because I think guys can kind of go into a dad mode even if they don't have a lot of experience of it. I think stepfathering was not that rare in prehistory. I think a lot of times young men would have been interacting with women who already had kids from other guys. And maybe the other guy is... Killed in battle. Killed in battle, run away, got gored by a mammoth, stung by bees, or just lacked interest in the woman, whatever. Hmm. So I think stepping into that role wasn't that unusual. But of course it brings some challenges mm-hmm. and conflicts and... You have to level up your maturity really fast. Wow. What were the ways in which it was easy? I guess the easy thing was finding common ground. So like with my stepson, he was also into science fiction and into certain kinds of similar music and into real-time computer strategy games. So if you want to make a bond with a teenage kid... Mm. Playing computer games together is a pretty good way to do it. Yeah, I'll bet. And what were the ways in which you struggled? Just knowing I wasn't his, quote, real dad, that I didn't quite have the authority over him that his real dad would have had. Also, some there's some mutual skepticism about, well, mom's dated other guys before this who have mm. also taken this role, and they didn't last, so are you really going to stick around? yeah. How serious are you? Are you going to take good care of my mom or hurt her or whatever? So it's interesting because you feel, you know, if you're dating a woman who's got no kids, you're accountable to her, right? And you want to do right by her. Mm -hmm. But if kids are in the mix, then suddenly the, the ethical stakes are quite a bit higher. Yeah. Because you you suddenly owe a duty of care, not just to her, but to her kids, as little entities unto themselves. At what point do you think that you were able to prove to him, or were you ever able to prove to him that you you were the stick-around type? Do you think there was a point, a turning point at which he softened to accept you more? Well, I think when his mom and I had our own kid, you know, and bought a house, bigger house to to live in and kind of make a family in and included my stepson in that whole process. And it was clear that we were trying to create a kind of stable structure where even if he goes off to college, he'll be able to come back to a a home base. I think that gave him a lot of reassurance. Mm. And it also helped, you know, if you're raising a baby, then when he interacted with his half-sibling and they had their own bond, right, that kind of ties you together Mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Because whatever happens, like, she's my daughter and she's his mom's daughter and she's his... His sister. Half-sister, right. Did you struggle to be monogamous in your marriage? It's a long time, 16 years. Yeah, and I made errors. I tried very hard, but I made some errors. Mm. And 
I'm a little wary about going into those in, in detail, but I think I did feel a constant strain between being kind of polyamorous by nature versus trying to respect the social norm of exclusive monogamy. Most monogamous people that I know don't have a conversation about what it means to them to be monogamous. Yeah. And all the non-monogamous people I know have conversations about what it means to them mm. to be non-monogamous. Yeah. Did you ever have a conversation about what it meant to you two to be monogamous? No, we didn't really clearly enough. And we were in marital therapy for years, so many therapy sessions. In retrospect, I think some of my skepticism about clinical psychology and marital therapy comes from frustration with that process. Mm. What uh, didn't uh, work about it for you? I think relationship and family and marital therapy in general is a very female-focused kind of space. Most of the therapists are women. I think if, mm. if a man and woman come into that space, the you know the female therapist will typically try to be impartial, mm. but she can't help but better understand the woman's concerns than the guy's concerns. And uh, it's often instigated by the woman. Yeah. And I did a very little bit of, I went to a sex therapist, Mal Harrison, with my ex, and I know that Part of it was me bringing him in to her for somebody else to point out what I'd been pointing out yeah. from the outside. Yeah. So that he would listen. Yeah. A lot of a lot of therapy is basically women wanting a second opinion to demonstrate to the boyfriend or husband. See, my worry is valid. I'm right. <laughs> I'm right. And you need to fix this. And <laughs> you need to level up. And I imagine that feels terrible. Yeah, and that's why men don't like going to therapy. Right. And it's a huge problem. And I've had little rants on Twitter about this recently, about how uh, clinical psychology is alienating men, and it's bad for relationships. Hmm. What do you think? Is there a fix that, you, that makes sense to you? I don't think m more male therapists would fix it, would it? I think the kind of guys who want to become clinical psych PhD therapists aren't often the kind of guys we need filling that role. What you have is basically a total split between the feminized psychotherapy culture on the one hand mm -hmm. and the manosphere, red pill, pickup artist culture on the other hand, which is completely different. It's not formalized. There's no accreditation. There's no PhDs. There's just guys trying to write and tell their truth about male-female dynamics as best they can and getting half of it wrong, but offering more value to a lot of guys than psychotherapy culture can. How could it serve men better, though? Well, for example, the Manosphere puts a lot of emphasis on how do women actually respond to different kinds of guys? So if you want to regain, let's say, some hotness and happiness and playfulness in a marriage, the typical psychotherapy solution would be, let's go to the psychotherapy, let's share our feelings, understand each other, let's emote, let's empathize, let's, let's do more intimacy, let's do little exercises, blah, blah, blah. Mm. The red pill approach would be more like, Guys, get off your asses, get in shape, lose your gut, increase your testosterone. And pick her up over your head. Get strong, right? Pick <laughs> her up over your head. And um, don't take as much of her shit. Make some fucking decisions for once. Mm -hmm. And be a more confident, assertive, playful, funny, irreverent uh, James Bond. Would that, from a psychotherapist, have been useful for you? I have a story that you felt misunderstood in your psychotherapy. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I think any advice like that would have been really helpful. So I think what happens is therapy actually rewards guys for doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. What a wife will see in psychotherapy is not a guy reclaiming his masculinity, 
but a guy knuckling under to a second woman, the therapist. Mm. Oh, he's obeying me and being mothered by this other woman. And he's got nothing left in terms of masculine polarity or yang energy or whatever new agey term you want to put on it, right? It sounds like the fundamental crux. It's kind of about guys have to sort this out amongst ourselves. But it sounds like the crux of why you wound up in the therapist's office was that she wasn't dating her species because you are a bit more poly by nature. And that would not have been fixed or helped by, you know, go get in shape and make some decisions. Right. In that particular case, th there were sort of some deeper issues about how should a couple have a conversation about negotiating what kind of relationship they want. Yeah. And for a lot of therapists, monogamous lifelong marriage is the default and the goal. And anything different is less. And they really do not know how to talk about any alternatives like being open or swinging or poly or monogamish or anything like that. Right. They're not offering a full toolbox yeah. for relationship by design. And I've had many conversations with my clinical colleagues who are training. You know, my department trains literally all of the clinical psych PhDs in the state of New Mexico. So we have a lot of impact on who gets trained and what their views are. And I've said for a while, we should be training these people to understand different relationship patterns. Of course. And we're not doing it. We're training them to understand about gay and lesbian sexuality. We're giving them zero training on poly, open, etc., which are actually more common statistically than being gay or lesbian. They are? A lot more common, yeah. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. People people have a total miscalibration about about this. But I just met a brick wall like nobody cares. Like it's not a protected group. I got a lot of moralizing, like, well, the research shows healthy attachment is correlated with monogamy. And I'd be like, literal scales that measure healthy attachment have baked in monogamous assumptions. And we don't have enough research yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if people are not being made aware of all the options that they have, they are hamstrung mm -hmm. in their search for an architecture that actually does work for them. Yeah. That's so frustrating. It's terrible. And it also means, you know, it's not just that, you know, monogamous people who might benefit from a little bit of swinger action twice a year, it's not just that they can't get what they need, but also if they're going to therapy and they're picking up this monogamous moralizing, then if their own kids or siblings or parents or swingers or whatever, mm -hmm. then they'll, they'll just sort of inherit the stigma against that from the therapist. It, it seems to remind me, and it's tied in with the arg these arguments against sex education. Like, well, if we educate children about sex, then they'll do it more, which is not the case, yeah. you know? And then when they do it, they do it with better protection. They do it with more awareness. Maybe they'll have a safer sex talk if they have that sex education. And it's like, if people are made aware of the possibilities in therapy, then there will just be this, this rampant polyamorous wave or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that that's not the case because I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are gonna opt out because they just don't feel like they can handle it. And that's just not for them. But at least then they'll be aware of ways that and ways that people have dealt with the the desire safety paradox that that Astaire talks about. Yeah. You know, ways that people have negotiated it, because otherwise people talk about feeling so broken. Like they're fucked up when they're not. Yeah, they're not. And, uh, you know. I mean, generally speaking, I think monogamy is 
great for many people and it often works and particularly for certain life stages. Like when you have young kids, mm -hmm. I think maybe it's a prudent, good idea. And like you can raise the possibility of having different relationship patterns without disrespecting either tradition or monogamy or marriage. There are ways to do it, like I try to do when I teach, that say there are options. They might be better suited to some people than others, yes. under some conditions than others. It depends on your personality, your emotional self-control, your communication skills, your cultural context, etc. Were there other factors? Those are really useful. I've gotten so much shit about this on Twitter, but I have tweeted things like, if you're going to do polyamory, it really helps to have a lot of emotional self-control. Yes, and emotional will, self-control. Like willpower, mm -hmm. conscientiousness, which is about organizing your life, following through on your promises, staying in touch with people when you say you will, and not being kind of a hot mess all the time. I would call that keeping integrity right. or... yeah. Like using your Google Calendar and using your phone book and stuff, getting back to people's emails. And also, I would include in that having an awareness of how your actions might impact others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both the people you're seeing and the other people they're seeing. Exactly, because every action in a polycule mm -hmm. affects the whole thing. Yeah. Doesn't just affect the one person or the two people. Conscientiousness. Self, emotional self-control, self -control. communication skills. Yeah, I think having a little bit of a slightly cool or cold rational streak, being able to step back from your own emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can do that by being a little bit of an Aspie who's not super emotional anyway. And when you use that term, you mean? Asperger's or just somebody who has a little trouble understanding the beliefs and desires of other people. So a little bit of a, neurodivergence, a little, which would right. mean a lack of empathy or a, a slight lack of empathy. Yeah, just being a little nerdy or geeky or socially awkward. But you can also get that rationality about your emotions by doing your mindfulness, mindfulness. meditation or taking your psychedelics and going, oh, the mind isn't what I thought it was mm. or whatever. And I think developing your sexual self-confidence helps a lot. Because if you don't know what the other person you're with is getting out of you sexually, it's very easy to imagine, oh, they could find somebody who's like way better than me. And then of course they'd leave. So I think you have to cultivate to the extent that you can a confidence that I'm actually worth staying with because I, I know things, I can do things, I can give people pleasure, I can do intimacy. Mm. And it, it is not actually a threat if my partner finds other people who can also do that. Because, yeah, we're sort of competing a bit, but it's a level playing ground. I have legitimate things I can offer, too. I think a lot of married people lose that confidence. Mm. Right? They see some outsider flirting with their partner, and they think, oh, shit, well, here he is, like, Younger, better looking, more exciting, you know, less encumbered, uh, freakier in bed, whatever. And, and and I have nothing to offer. Well, you should make sure you do have stuff something to offer. offer. Yeah. Jana always says that another one of the factors, a contributor to success as a polyamorous and, or a non monogamous person is social support mm -hmm. yeah. for the lifestyle. Yeah, feeling like I'm a freak by social standards and this is heavily stigmatized, but at least... I have my freaky friends. Right, I have my <laughs> freaky friends and I have my freaky family. And <laughs> so, for example, I found it very helpful two or three years ago when I told my parents, hey, I'm dating a woman. Mm. She's polyamorous. I'm polyamorous now. We have an open relationship. And my parents, bless their hearts, who are in their you know 70s at that point, Instead of going, oh my God, that's terrible and sinful. My mom said, okay, give me some suggested readings. Oh. And I'm, and then I talked to her a few days later and she said, I read the Wikipedia entry on polyamory. Oh. And I, I, I printed out all 14 pages. And <laughs> your dad read them too. And, and we, do, we do have questions. <laughs> we have questions, but 
And I thought that's about as cool a response as you could hope that for. That is so beautiful that I am crying a little bit. Yeah, you <laughs> that's are. such a beautiful response. <laughs> okay, give me some suggested reading. That's so great. If you think, well, people giving me trollish negative feedback on my YouTube videos, at least my parents support me, my brother supports me, mm -hmm. my best friends know about it and support me. Everyone in my department knows about it and is more or less okay with it. Those are the people who are right next to you in your daily life, right? And in your emotional life. Yeah. Not these people, these people spitting at you in the town square of the internet. Exactly. So this is the first time in my life that I am exploring a non-monogamous relationship and not just fucking somebody who has a primary partner, mm -hmm. which are the only real experience that I'd had with it before. And I've, since I came to live at the villa, I have been unsure about, I was like, well, I'm not polyamorous. And if this is a poly house, I don't really qualify. And then the former real estate agent was like, no, no, it's not. That's what the media is calling it. But it's it's actually a sex positive intentional community. And you don't have to be poly to live there. You just have to be mm -hmm. open minded. I said, that is not a problem. But I don't know where I I don't know where I land on this spectrum. I don't know where I fall. And that has been true and is still true. And I think it is likely that I am more fluid than maybe most humans in terms of relationship styles. But also, maybe I'm just much more non-monogamous and much more novelty-driven than I ever thought. And it's maybe taken <laughs> five years of talking deeply mm -hmm. about these things to unravel some of the hold that society has on my relationship ideals. So it's been a month and a half and I want to tell you the whole story. But last night, and I found out, I found this out while we, while we were together, just before we went to brunch. Mm. Last night, I knew that it might happen. Last night was the first time that he has had sex with someone while we've been together. Even though we've been yeah. saying that we, that this is something that we are exploring. And I said that I didn't want to give up my lover, who actually told me when we had a meal yesterday saw him for the first time in a month and a half yesterday yeah it is a month and a half because <laughs> it's the last time i saw him was pretty much on the same night that he doesn't really know that he wants to engage with me sexually anymore hmm. i am surprised and impressed with myself how okay i currently feel about it i'm amazed actually and who knows what happens when I get close to him physically, mm -hmm. how, how it will feel. But I'm, I'm pretty excited for myself right now. <laughs> so on March 30th, there was an event called... No, I'm going to go further back. In February, on Valentine's Day, I wanted to do an immersive experience, an immersive Valentine's experience that would be as pleasurable to go to alone as it would be to go to with your partner or partners. And so I modeled it after a cross between an event that I'd done, a fundraising event that I'd done with this immersive theater company that I did a show with called Woodshed Collective, where there was a happening in each room and people had to, to pay a token to get into each room and and they were putting together a story from, from that experience. And 29 rooms, which is a an Instagrammable in series of installations mm -hmm. created by Refinery29. But I didn't like that because it was just all commercial and there was no there was no heart to it. And so I wanted to have this this immersive experience where you would have happenings on each floor and in the backyard there's the hot tub. And so the the rule for getting into the hot tub was that you had to be undressed by the attendant because I wanted it to be a sexy party, but not a sex party. I wanted it to be edgy and maybe bring people into situations that they'd never been in before, but not actually have high risk. And so being undressed by somebody else, most people have not been undressed by anybody but their lover mm -hmm. 
since they were a child. And so to have a stranger undress you, I was really excited about that. And it seems that it went as I had hoped. People mm-hmm. felt that it was a it was a kind of a magical, kind of intense, kind of beautiful experience to be undressed by somebody else like that. And then in the basement there was a there was a little photo booth area and otherwise people were asked to check their phones and the phone booth was right next the coat check was right next to the photo booth area so I really wanted people to just put down their devices and actually have an opportunity to connect and maybe feel a little bit awkward sometimes you know and look for look for opportunities to connect and so on the third floor, there were four-handed massages that you could watch and, and you know, be in line for. And on the second floor, there was a, a latex shining. One of my housemates, Morel, who's a, a pro dom sometimes, and, and live erotica reading while she was wearing latex. So there, she had an audience. And then on the first floor, there was a woman dressed as a pinup. And she was doing live baking. So you were, there were these delicious, sm- I wanted it to be all sensory. So there was, were these delicious smells from the oven. And then there was this, this array of treats that people could have. And then in 14 rooms, there are 14 bedrooms. It wasn't all the bedrooms. There were a couple of other spaces. One was a bathroom and one was in the basement space surrounded by a little curtain. But there was a different one-on-one, usually, immersive experience in each room. So in my room, there was tarot. And you didn't know what you were getting. You had to take a risk Mm -hmm. and just go pick a room and go into it. And people kind of played along with the secretiveness of it. And they wouldn't tell other people what was in the room, which I loved, you know, because then it held this kind of mystery and you just had to take a chance. And if somebody came out looking really happy, you would think, oh, well, let me go in there. And the room next to mine... She did, she asked, do you want a fast dance or a slow dance? And she would dance with them for one song. And then in Zed's room, he had created an aural experience with huge speakers where he had you put on two layers of ear protection and lie down in between and underneath this speaker architecture where you felt the music. Mm-hmm. I've never felt music like that. Mm-hmm. The vibration was inside. It was my blood vibrating mm-hmm. and my organs. It was incredible. There were one-on-one poetry readings in one of the bathrooms on the second floor where she was reading to them while they were curled up in the nest that we'd made in the bathtub. There was a, a meditative experience where two people offered you a kind of tea ceremony and then meditated with you. There was intimacy coaching in one room and psychotherapy in another. And he did a psychotherapy experience. I can't remember what, it, what it's called now, but it, it seemed quite similar to me to circling. Yeah. So he was essentially doing a, a kind of a one-on-one somatic circling experience with people. And then there was one room that was a decoration station where she had glitter and fake tattoos and and she was and she was adorning people. And I love the intimacy of and that's often why I bring glitter around and these mm-hmm. tribal markers because I love the closeness and sweetness of adorning somebody. I think that's why hair salons are so important in many of our societies. That's the touch that people get. That's the kind touch that people get. And thus is very, very needed, very necessary and longed for. In Arno's room, there was, I think, a six to eight person experience where he guided them through having all hands on one body and then mm-hmm. cycling through. Where it was a, D- a DJ experience as well. And then there was rope suspension Mm. happening on the first floor. So there are all these experiences and... So it started to tell me... Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going there. Okay, okay. And I felt incredibly proud to have curated an experience like that that allowed... People told me that it was the best Valentine's Day they've ever had. Mm. And to take this commercialized, forced experience of romance Mm. and turn it into something that actually 
cultivated intimacy among many, many people, mm -hmm. I was deeply proud of. So a few weeks after that, I had a I had a dip because it was such it was the biggest event that I'd ever thrown, mm -hmm. and I, I had a crash. Mm -hmm. Or people who go to conferences call it con drop. Yeah, you know. And I asked my friend Jillian, who runs the Joy List, a weekly compendium of uh, events that you can go to in New York alone and leave with a friend. So she's she put my event in. She put 14 rooms in the joy list. And I asked her what she was excited about that week. And she told me three things. And she said, what are you excited about? And I thought about it. And I, the actual answer was not, I was not excited about anything. Mm. The actual answer was nothing. And that is terrible. I have so many, so many options to be excited about things in my life. I was really kind of horrified to hear myself say that. And she says, well, why don't you come with me to this event called Open Brain? Open Brain is a salon, and in this case, it's held. It's held in all different places. In this case, it's held in a in an apartment in the financial district, and you can share anything that you're working on creatively or want to dust off or you know pull out of your back pocket. And so I went to this, and I hadn't been singing or performing, and so I sang this tango song. When Jillian came, she came with a group of people right before I sang. And in that group of people was my lover, Michael. And I met him for the first time. And we went then kind of on an adventure together because afterwards he said, I'm going to meet Steve Dean. I said, who's Steve Dean? And Jillian said, you don't know Steve Dean? You should meet Steve Dean. And Steve Dean was just on the podcast and is a dating expert. He's been on a total, I think, of 200 apps. He's active on 80 of them. He's a modern dating mm. expert. And so I went to meet him. And then Michael and I started connecting. And we had an adventurous evening where we traipsed through Williamsburg and found tacos late at night. And so this, that I, and I was almost not going to go. But the fact that I got, that I pushed myself, I was like, no, go. And I got off my butts and left the house and went to this open brain. I met my new lover and I met Steve Dean. And Steve turned out to be doing an event that sounded quite similar to 14 Rooms called the Love Immersive. And the Love Immersive was in, I think, a five-story townhouse and was centered around the five love languages and was intended to be an immersive experience where people could explore love languages. And if they didn't know what they how they receive love, it would be a chance to experiment and, and explore. And he invited me to be a part of it. So I set up an installation in a closet that was a horizontal installation. And on the floor, I set up this cozy mat and blanket and pillow, and I had three sets of headphones. And because I know that in an environment like that, it can get really overwhelming. And if you don't have a break space, like usually the third floor, when we have our 250 person sex parties at the house, mm -hmm. the third floor is a sex free zone and a cuddle mm -hmm. space. And it's a breather mm -hmm. and you need it. You need mm -hmm. a place like that. And this place had no place like that where you could just escape. And also people were drinking, which I do mm -hmm. not like, is I not think is ideal. Mm -hmm. But this was an opportunity for people to just go into a, a quiet space. And I created an 11 minute guided audio mm -hmm. meditation about the upper limits problem and how we might navigate that and the kind of how we might take rest in order to be able to experience more pleasure and raise our upper limit. That day happened to be my first time seeing Michael again since I met him at Open Brain or since our dates that time on his trip. And we'd had amazing afternoon delight, mm -hmm. really fierce, ferocious, mm -hmm. great sex. And I showed up right at the event, like start time, right mm -hmm. as the audience was arriving. And I was radiating mm -hmm. because I felt incredibly well fucked, incredibly taken care of, seen and appreciated and excited. Mm -hmm. That night, I wanted to babysit the station because I had put signs up that said, 
Need a break? Is the door open? If yes, come in. If not, wait. And I thought that that would take care of the user experience, but it really doesn't because mm -hmm. people are people and don't necessarily read signs and might be drunk. And mm -hmm. so I was babysitting my station by doing sensation play right next to it. And I had mm -hmm. my pinwheel and I had my, what else did I have? I had my, my claws mm -hmm. And I was pulling hair and scratching and massaging and doing all kinds of fun things. And I was wearing this flower crown. The touch room was down the hall. And the first person who came over to me just kind of walked straight towards me. It was this beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed man, which is my visual type. And he said, that looks gorgeous on you. Mm. And I said, would you like some sensation play? And he said, yes, please. And that was Patrick. Mm. So this is my first time meeting Patrick. And I gave him sensation play and I was impressed at what a, it's, it's an art to receive. I was impressed mm. at what a receiver he was. And I complimented him on it. And he said, it's just today, it's new. I didn't know any different, right? But he's just struck me as incredibly receptive and warm. And I felt attracted to him and turned on. And I had an idea when I was on my way that I was gonna meet someone that night. And I wondered how that was gonna go being that I had a date. Michael has dabbled in non-monogamy, but still that was my date for the evening. Mm -hmm. And it just turned out that the whole night they just passed each mm -hmm. other. Michael went off to do some work. That's when I met Patrick. Patrick left to go explore the party. Michael came and brought me food and then went away. Patrick came back. And then I, it was it was kind of astonishing, completely unorchestrated by me. Mm -hmm. And before Patrick left, uh, we had exchanged numbers. And I just kind of took his face and said, I want to see you. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to see you too. And he left. And the key thing that happened that night was... He came up to me and he was looking kind of emotional. And I said, I feel the impulse to take care of you. And then I wondered, am I always going to be taking care of him? And he said, thank you so much for saying that. Because I just had the revelation this morning with his lover, with a lover of his, that I seek out nurturing women in order to get a nurturing that I did not receive. And so that's a really important reinforcement for me to hear that from you. Mm. So he left. And then I spent the night with Michael at a hotel, contacted him the next day. And we started, we started seeing each other. He came, he came over, I think two days later and it was hot. And I felt really also just smitten. I was just like go googly eyed and, and that, state is a little uncomfortable for me. So I was kind of like, oh, too much. Turning away and felt like I was upper limiting pretty constantly with mm -hmm. him. And then the sexual experience that we had that night, he had, he had talked to his lover. He had one lover at the time and said that he met me and they knew that they weren't in it for the long term. She wants children. She wants them soon. She's 33. And he's 26. He does not know if he wants children. He was also, at the time, thinking he was going to move back to Puerto Rico. And so they were like, okay, well, this is a, a short-term thing. And so they were able to have, because there was, n was not that long-term pressure, they were actually able to have an incredibly communicative, more so than either of them had ever had before, type of relationship. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he was still living with his ex-girlfriend. Up until recently, they were living in an apartment together, but were no longer having a sexual relationship. So, And that's an interesting thing that happens a lot in New York, where mm. people break up, but due to rent and leases, yep. they can't move out. And so they're living together and trying to navigate no longer being in a sexual relationship, but still kind of in a romantic relationship and cohabitating, they had opened up their relationship about four months prior. He'd met this lover and they were starting to, to see each other and they were fluid bonded. And so she said, 
you know, I don't know if I'm going to want to have sex with you if you have sex with her tonight. Mm -hmm. But if you do, as a courtesy to me, please use condoms. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, let's definitely, let's definitely do that. Though he was tempted not to. He was feeling really embarrassed at losing his erection. Mm -hmm. And I had just read Pamela Madsen's wonderful treatise about loving soft cocks. Mm -hmm. And she's like, really, hard cocks are not the only thing, you know, and soft cocks can receive pleasure and can give pleasure, you know, and I was able to hold that space very sweetly. Mm. And it was a really lovely experience. And then we spent more time together. Anytime I would feel that he was putting me in this role of the nurturing mommy Mm. and seeking approval from me and seeking from me and needing, I would get totally turned off because it felt like a dynamic that I have with my mother where my mother always wants more attention than I want to give and feels needy. And that is a obviously a complete turn off to my libido. We realized that he was also playing out a dynamic that he had with his mother, which was unhealthy of seeking from, let's say, a a colder woman or a woman who's really involved with her career. His mother's a professional violinist and has always been kind of about Mm -hmm. her career. And so as we got into this loop, I didn't want to have sex at all. Mm -hmm. And I was not enjoying his affection His lover, by the way, had said she didn't want to continue. They had a a night where they they made a decision that they were not going to continue because it didn't make sense for what she wants in her life. And I wanted him to keep her because I was feeling, I wasn't feeling attraction, but I felt a lot of love. And I thought, well, this relationship is going to be gone because I'm not having this attraction and he doesn't have another outlet. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to, implode one night i i said i think i think we're gonna have to shift to being loving friends because Mm. i i feel like i'm constantly hurting him i felt like i was constantly hurting him and that dynamic was so unsexy so it's just like i was getting less and less and less attracted what i wanted from him was dominant aggressive male energy He said, I want to offer that. And that is what I would like too. But I don't feel safe to do that unless I feel desired. And he wasn't feeling desired by me. Mm. So we had this unvirtuous circle or something, this downward spiral. That's where you need role play to cut through that Gordian knot. Yeah? We can talk about that later if you want. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, usually that's the solution. What wound up happening was this. A couple days after that conversation, I had invited him the week before to a cuddle party, a small cuddle party that I was telling you about earlier that was held in my friend's bedroom, really big bedroom, so about Mm. probably 15 people. And I wanted to go very much. I needed that touch, but I also had a deadline for the podcast that was if I didn't get the edit notes and the intro outro to my editor that night, I wasn't going to be able to release it on time because he wasn't going to be able to do it on time. I was like, I can do it all. I I want to do it all. And so I went and I would dip in for a little bit. And then I would pull over to this little nook in the corner of the room where I could see everything and everybody. And I put my headphones on and write my edit notes. As it happened, Patrick started cuddling with a friend of mine. She's a woman, a young woman, who I was in that immersive show with, and I had done that immersive fundraiser with, and actually was a part of 14 Rooms, because we'd become very close three years ago when we were doing that show. Mm -hmm. And then something happened with her, and I asked her about it. She felt really distant from me, and she wouldn't tell me what it was, and I just wound up feeling friend rejection Mm -hmm. and just feeling hurt. And also feeling hurt 
by somebody so much younger than me who I'd taken sort of a, a mm. an older sister mm. role with felt even even worse or even more painful somehow. Mm. And so it's just been since February that she reached out to me and said, I think what you're doing is amazing. I've been listening to the podcast. It's changing my life. If you want any help, if you want to volunteer for 14 rooms, I would I would love to do that. And I thought about it and reached back to her and I said, I would like that. And so we've seen each other in group environments and at events and my events mm -hmm. since then, but not one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of slowly dipping our toes back into the water of friendship. And then he winds up in this clinch with her right in front of me. And it's, I mean, three feet from my feet mm -hmm. is where they are cuddling. And he's on her right side. And his nose is just pressed into her temple like he's just mm. breathing her in. And I feel this maelstrom of things. And what I feel is resentment and anger and jealousy and arousal. <sighs> This episode was mixed and mastered by Irving Godori. You can find him for all your audio needs, including recording live music, at igrecording.com. As always, my lovely intro music was composed by Alan Markley, Plastic Cannons on the Instagram. And my saucy likeness of a logo was illustrated by Shauna Shea, whom you can hire through 99designs. To listen to next week's episode, the second part of my conversation with Jeffrey Miller, in which we do a deep dive into jealousy, particularly mine, polyamory, particularly his, and evolutionary psychology. Become a patron of the Horizontal Arts on patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. Until next time. <laughs> May you have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. I'm daydreaming and fantasizing and deeply looking forward to my first podcast conference in mid-August in Orlando. So if you know any horizontal types in either Orlando or Miami, send them my way. Also, what do you think about this? Horizontal listeners as a group. Hawsies. Thoughts? Comments? Concerns? Let me know. Big love from Bushwick. Thank you for listening. Do you need any kind of, I don't know, lozenge, tea? Hmm. Are you coughing because you are? Nervous. Nervous, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'm not used to doing um, interviews on my back. <laughs> Wednesday said that was that was hard on her voice. I find it easier on mine, but plus I've been looking forward to like trying this little experiment for about a year since meeting you. So pressure's on. <laughs> I think we can just talk. We've been having a great conversation for hours. Mm -hmm. And just continue. <laughs>